All right, everybody. Thanks for coming back week after week to Strange Stories with the Seeker and the Skeptic. I'm Jonathan. I am the Skeptic. I am Brittany. I am the Seeker. Uh, this week, we are going to be speaking with a friend of mine, Marcus. He is the Vice Director of Gaming Entertainment at Roanoke's Crest City Con, the premier nerd convention of Roanoke, Virginia, yearly. A uh, good friend of mine, a gamer. Appreciate you coming out with us and having a conversation this evening. Marcus, how you doing, man? It's a pleasure, and I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Um, So, Marcus, you shared with us in your questionnaire that um, you had a lot of strange things happen, especially, like, in your childhood. So can you tell us about some of the things that happened when you were a kid? Yeah, so I would say my earliest time I've been told that I had something go on is when I was like three or four years old, I used to talk to the man upstairs in the house. And it, you know, I wasn't talking to God. I was literally talking to an old man that lived in the attic. I'd sit at the base of the steps and talk to him. It never really seemed to bother anybody. And like personal memory, I don't have of it. I just remember as I got older, I always felt like somebody was up there. But I, once I got to where I could remember things, I just never dealt with the attic much. Because, you know, it's just rooms full of junk, mostly. And then we had a house fire in 2003, and it just, like, that feeling went away. Is that part of the house that, that burned? Uh, yeah, The house was completely burned. Oh, okay. Yeah, it had to be completely gutted. And after that, it's just like the feeling was different. That's very interesting. Yeah, for sure. How old were you back then in like 2003? Uh, in 2003, I was 10, just about to turn 11. Do you remember like any experiences from like after you were younger seeing ghosts or anything like that? Or was it mostly just feelings at that point? Um. It's always been feelings for me, like at, at the point of memory. Now, I do have a vague memory of maybe five or six years old. I was at the Sunnybrook Plantation restaurant that's on Plantation Avenue or Plantation Road, whatever it is. And it used to be like a home place style buffet. And the family's favorite table, because when we brought everybody's when we went, it was right next to this air vent in the wall. And I specifically remember sitting there talking to a boy in the vent. Somebody asking me who I was talking to. I tell them and I turn around and he's gone. Like complete details I don't have a ton of. But it's just... Like, I have that specific memory of I was talking to the boy, and then he was gone. And it was just like a boy my age. And how old were you at that time? Uh, five, six. Mm -hmm. J just old enough to start remembering things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How did uh, how did the adults in your life handle you, like, you know, talking about this kind of stuff and, and saying that? What was that? What was that like? Well, actually, it was, it's rather interesting because it's like, from what I understand, there wasn't really an air of concern. I'm sure there was probably some things of like, he's just talking to an imaginary friend or something. I haven't really questioned like what people did, but mostly it just makes a fun talking point now for my parents. You know, Marcus used to talk to ghosts type thing. <laughs> yeah. And, and my mom's firm believer that, like, the old man upstairs was a ghost. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, before the house fire, we had heard things. Like, people walking up and down the steps. Someone walking up and down. And no one went upstairs. But 
And that was not like a space that someone like had a workspace there. Like nobody lives up there or anything. No, like it, it was just storage. At, at the time, it was just where we kept all our old toys and all the things mom and dad brought with them when they moved in. Um, at the time, they'd only had the house four or five years. They bought the house the year I was born. So. I mean, it's interesting. Um, we hear so many stories about people who saw things when they were kids and then the adults in their lives really shut it down. But you had a very different experience um, growing up. So I just wonder, like, have you always been kind of open that ghosts could be a thing? Or was there ever a time in your life where you were more skeptical? Well, to say I believe in ghosts, I can't. It's, to me, I, I'm not against the belief of them, but I, until I, I have solid proof, you know, whether personal or actual, it doesn't matter. I mean, if I see a ghost, I've seen a ghost. That's how I feel. But until I have something a little more solid to me in my mind, I'm not going to say I believe like people have been haunted and chased out of their houses that may be what they believe and i can understand what things may cause that you to believe that i just i've never had anything like that happen to me so i can't say i'm 100 percent. oh yeah that's real yeah you don't really want to put a name on it because how do you know yeah i, I get that I, I kind of feel a similar way about certain things that you know I, I believe people have had experiences i think that often they're uh where they go with it you know the the conclusions that are often incorrect or at least premature yeah, premature collision con conclusions yeah i mean i've had moments where my mind has run away with things and that i'm 30 years old and i'm scared of the dark sometimes <laughs> Me too. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean. Well, that's where the monsters are, man. Yeah. <laughs> the gray aliens. Yeah. <laughs> I've seen um, a meme recently that was like, you're not scared of the dark. You're scared of what's in the dark. Yeah. And it's like, at night, when I'm home alone, or everyone's asleep, we have a French, a glass French door in the back like the back door mm -hmm. and it is extremely creepy to just sit there and stare outside of out of it because it's just like you're staring into the dark into the weeds in the backyard you know mm -hmm. I get that yeah. for sure well since you brought up gray aliens you did say that you had a UFO experience so can you tell us about that <laughs> Okay, so I'm not out here saying it's aliens. Okay. I have no clue. <laughs> because it's not like I saw a machine or a vehicle and nothing touched down. But I was on my way home with my partner, Michael, from McDonald's a few years ago. And we're driving through on Cleveland Avenue in Benton. And all of a sudden, there is this lovely bright red like the red you see at a sunset light in the sky and just like the paranoia in the back of my mind is going this is the end of the world <laughs> you know because it's it's literally coming straight at us down like a meteor or something you know mm -hmm. and then it just kind of stops in midair hangs there a while and it stays, you know, like in the sky way yes. like the moon would be as we're driving along. It still hangs there. We finally pull over and get out. And as soon as we get out of the car, it's gone. And Michael saw a flash real quick as we went to get out of the car. But I didn't see that as I was exiting. 
And um, we sat there for better part of 30 minutes trying to recreate, like maybe it was a trick of the light, like the street lights or something. But we drove through there. We, we made circles through this part of Cleveland Avenue and never had the light appear again. So I'm certain it wasn't like a trick of the light. Mm-hmm. And, but I, it was the most intense feeling I'd ever had. Yeah. Like I said, I, up until like it stopped moving, I was just certain like this is the end of the world. Mm-hmm. It's the kind yeah. of red the mushroom cloud out. coming out, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's understandable. You have no idea something like that is coming. So that was. Just for, for people who don't have context on, on Roanoke, Virginia, and, and I have made the statement on multiple episodes that um, you know I, I've had maybe a single strange experience within Roanoke City. And I know don't know that I know anyone who's had any serious experiences in Roanoke City itself. But for the, those who aren't from this area, uh, Vinton is is kind of across the street from Roanoke in a lot of ways. So that's probably the closest big experience I've heard of someone saying that's real close to Roanoke city itself. So that's super interesting to me because Roanoke feels to me very much to be like a paranormal dead zone in a way. That means I'll go five of these sixes. Like that house you had that experience with when you were were growing up, was that in Roanoke city or is that somewhere else? Uh, It's in Roanoke County. Um, And like you said, for people who don't know, when people say Roanoke, they mean the entire Valley half the time oh for sure there's Uh like three cities two counties uh, a couple communities like there's it's there's a sprawl yeah it 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 could mean any one of several towns and they all say rona and um yeah it it was a plantation i've done some research into it because i was curious you know like why am i seeing ghosts when i'm a little kid and it was a plantation house Oh. all the way up to the you know end of the civil war and the family maintained a small plantation after that um with sharecroppers and that kind of thing um and the family finally completely did away with owning the property at all when they sold the restaurant closed the restaurant and sold it but it's actually the reason Plantation Road is named Plantation Road. It was oh. the largest plantation on that side of town. Um, That's a pretty long actually, history then. Yeah. The entire length of Plantation Road was the, I want to say, eastern border of the plantation. That's a big um, property. Yeah. Yeah. But they sold a lot of it to the city, and um, one of the parks over there, Sunnybrook Park, is named after the plantation, and is built on the land from the plantation. That's interesting to me. Uh, just just uh, having been in Roanoke for about seventeen years, there are multiple businesses throughout Roanoke that have Sunnybrook in the name. Uh, that that is a a theme you see here. Yeah. I did not know that that connection was there. That's very interesting. Yeah. Um, Sunny Brook is a small creek, if you can call it that, that runs most of the length of Plantation Road. And that they named the plantation after Sunny Brook. Wow. I learned all kinds of stuff about my adopted <laughs> hometown this evening. That's pretty awesome. <laughs> that experience with the red light um were there other cars around did it look like anybody else was noticing what you guys were seeing or was it just you guys well see we had just we were the last ones through the intersection before the light changed and like we even stopped there and went through several changes of the light to see if it was like the red light behind us Mm -hmm. was like reflecting in the windshield or something and we never saw you just couldn't anything replicate anything replicated and it was just wow it, yeah it was it was the wildest thing i've ever experienced and it was the yeah. first real 
Well, I would have to say the second real time, something has just creeped me out to the core. Well, Like, now you got to tell us the first time. all right. So, I, I don't want to get ahead of what we're talking, but the first time was the very first time I ever had a premonition. And that was probably when I was eight years old. My great grandmother passed away. And, you know, when you're a kid, the time frame and differences and memories isn't as great. But I would say six or eight months before she passed away, I had a dream one night that was just innocuous, but I'm standing there in a suit, which is unusual. And my mom's talking to her aunt and they're both sad and crying. And, you know, I, I remember the feeling, the thoughts in my head, like, why is everybody crying? Why is everyone upset? And then I got the instance of deja vu when we were after the funeral, we had stepped outside and my mom's talking to her aunt. And the same words are said. And I got that instant feeling of I've done this before. Mm. And from that point on, I had kind of ignored it. But it has happened several times since then. And it is the creepiest feeling to feel like you've done something before and, and lived things that are not predetermined or at least you think they're not predetermined. <laughs> right. Yeah. It opens up a whole bunch of questions, I guess. Yeah. Started to consume my life as I've gotten older. That's so. definitely a thing that can happen. You know, once you start seeing you know, connections and things. And sometimes, you know, sometimes connections are connections and sometimes they are just, you know, things that rhyme with each other, you know? Yeah. In what ways has it consumed your life? Um, so like I said, it, it's happened several times and it kind of bothers you a little bit or at least bothers me that when I have a dream and it involves people I care about, and something bad happening, like, you know, a nightmare, all of a sudden it makes you go, well, is this real or not? Mm -hmm. Will this happen or not? I've even gotten some times I felt like I dodged a bullet because I had a premonition. An astonishing feeling, especially when you're a skeptic like I am, because mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not going to sit here and say I'm not skeptical of things. To me, the paranormal activity doesn't it makes a good movie but it doesn't just resonate that that's the way things actually work mm -hmm. oh, I, I, just, uh, I, I definitely agree with you on on like you know the th things happen to people people have experiences you know I've had experiences you clearly have experiences Brittany's has experiences most people who listen to this probably have some experience or another where they're like, I cannot tell somebody this because this, you know, I can't, I cannot science this into a thing. Um, and most of it is stuff that taken by itself, you can kind of tell yourself is not a big deal or not really a thing, or you can explain away. But then you, you look at a couple of things that happen to you throughout time and you realize, you know, while, while nothing is like the movies and TV says, you know, all that stuff is exaggerated because they, they've got to sell a ticket, you know, they, they've got to keep you interested. Then, you know, Hollywood needs a plot to happen. You know, they, they need, there needs, needs to be a story and there might not necessarily be a story. That, that might not be how that works. It could just be that some of, some people, most people maybe even see or experience things that you don't always have words for. Uh, when you, when you've had these, Premonitory experiences. Do, you, do you, does it feel like? Is there ever a sense that it's coming from 
something or is it just happening to you or some third thing I'm not thinking of? Um, it's just a dream. Yeah, it, it comes through as just a dream. I'll lay down, go to sleep, have a very weird dream. Um, sometimes they involve me seeing a green goat, <laughs> um, which I've always found interesting. Yeah. And like, and sometimes it won't even be related to the dream I'm having at the time. Like, you know, everyone has dreams of stuff they do all the time. Go to work, driving, that kind of thing. School dreams. Yeah. And it's like sometimes it will take an entire segment out of my dream to show me something or to live something I'm going to live or may live or something. And then it'll pick up and go back to where it was, or I'll wake up. Mm -hmm. So it's like but, cuts in into a dream that you're having, and then it's kind of like this flash of yeah, potentially what's to come. Um, you know, I know dreams are a very personal experience, but I've had a lot of instances in dreams where I'm doing something, I'm talking to someone, and then I turn around and it's like, you're in another scene. Um, almost like, you know, changing scenes in a movie or something. Mm -hmm. And throughout the, that's when all of a sudden I'll like shift into something that, you know, is innocuous, but it really gets you wondering like, why am I around these people? Who are these people? Because one thing I find very interesting is well a lot revolves around people i know sometimes it revolves around people i don't like not so much that i'm not with somebody i know or something in the dream it's just um there's also strangers there and and sadly a lot of this sticks out to really sad and traumatic events in my life like, it would be better if, you know, the dreams about winning the lottery came true. <laughs> yeah, the winning numbers. I was going to ask that. Are all of these dreams about big, significant events, or is it ever, like, the mundane? Well, I've had the ones that are mundane. Like, I think I've had this conversation before in a dream. Mm -hmm. Are instances where i think well my mind could create that because it's a viable conversation to have with this person like okay. there was one time going to the beach with michael i was 110 percent we'd had this exact conversation before in the car and the only thing that was weird about it is we had just gotten that car so it couldn't have been so you're talking literally a month of we haven't been around each other he's just had this car but this exact moment and situation feels exactly the same mm -hmm. as when I dreamt but that I can justify my mind well that was just you know a dream becoming reality based on the possibility that my mind sees for it yeah but, and see, I don't know how it works. I don't know if maybe my subconscious is picking up on things, like what I do in my life. You know, the subconscious thoughts you have when you read things, that kind of thing. And then it just becomes a very close, my dreams become a very close facsimile to, facsimile to reality later on. Or if I'm honestly seeing the potential future do you believe in like psychics that people could have different psychic abilities <laughs> i believe in extreme empathy 
I, I do believe there are people out there whose mind can read the subtle body language, the subtle way somebody's eyes look. It's not something you do and like you can see it. And it's not something you even pick up on, but you can read and feel emotions based on the way people act. I don't think, to a sense, I feel like people have auras, but I don't think the way it connects with each other and the way we connect with each other has as much to do with something that can't be explained more than it is something we haven't explained yet. Um, like we don't have the tools yet, basically. Well, it, the tools and understanding. And I think yeah. we're getting close because, you know, Einstein said spooky action at a distance. Or I, I'm assuming it's Einstein. I, science history wasn't my greatest field. <laughs> <laughs> now, my great unfinished college education, I do remember some things about physics and things. And they do a lot of talk about quantum particles one particle will move when it's way over here and one's over there and i've watched several things of talking about the quantum particles that exist in our brain and i think a lot of things people don't understand are quantum inter interactions and quantum experiences we're having versus you know, like the Greeks used to explain lightning with Zeus. And the Norse right. explained thunder with Thor. And I think now, I mean, there's no way we could possibly truly understand right now what quantum physics is. Well, yeah, we're just starting to create the terms. I mean, the idea of quantum yeah. entanglement is, is more theory than anything else. But, I mean, if you think about it, you know, we, we, we basically, quote, proved the atom existed in 1827. Yeah. That's a, less than a blink of an eye when it comes to, you know, even human history and human history is a blink of an eye in, in, in you know, the life cycle of the planet Earth. Yeah. So, you know, to, to say that we really know anything is kind of hubris in a way. Yeah. So I think I'm with you on that. I think there's a lot of people in this field, like kind of paranormal investigation or even like spirituality. Um, like I'm an energy person. I'm a Reiki person. And we talk in terms of like the quantum field and, like and that, and not, and we're, it's like, we're waiting for science to kind of catch up with things I'm, well, I guess I'm going to speak for myself that like I've experienced, you know, so I, I think a lot of what you're yeah. saying is resonating with me for sure. Yeah. And see, it's like when I listen to people talk about their experiences, because like, obviously I'm an avid listener of the podcast, but just it, the entire thing interests me in general. And there are some people who come across as genuine. They genuinely experience these things. Well, no matter what the explanation is, they've mm -hmm. experienced these things. And reality is what you make it. Mm -hmm. And then there are people that I think are attention seeking. And I don't think the lady on TV who says she's talking to your dead sister from 40 years ago is talking to your dead sister from 40 years ago. I think she's wanting to be on TV. Um, but at the same time, when people tell me like they sat there and talked, they just you know, woke up in the middle of the night and their mother was sitting at the edge of their bed and they talked to her for an hour. What are you doing here? And they realize they find out that their mother died two hours ago at home, at her home. 
Yeah, I can believe that. To me, that's not that's not beyond the realm of possibility for me. But I think the time tends to tell the tale on a lot of these these people you see on on television and stuff like the the ones that are that are not being real that they eventually slip up they're they're always eventually and sometimes it takes you know a season on tv and sometimes it takes 20 years but eventually they're they're always some you know especially since like you know the the ones that are are really like out there about it generally they need help to do these things and you know people talk like this is why i don't believe in conspiracies because once you get more than you know one person in on something, somebody's going to tell somebody in a bar or something. Like there, there is no such thing as a, you know, I yeah. can't remember what old dead white guy said. Um, you know, two can keep a secret if one of them's dead. Like yeah, I'm, I I know the old saying, and as far as I go with conspiracies, it's like people talk about. Kennedy being a conspiracy. The government killed him. Right? Well, my thing is, would that conspiracy even be around if somebody didn't blow the whistle and it just got around? (laughs) You get what I'm saying? Yeah. I I don't know if what they say is true or not. Because the one one entity I know we can't trust is organized government. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Organized because, people in general, I think. Is, is, <laughs> yeah. big, there's always a, a, a real potential for corruption there. I, I, I really think that, that most of the people who are very conspiracy-minded, like the people who are really they knuckle down into the conspiracy thought processes, I think these are people who really want the world to be under someone's control because it makes them makes the world make sense to them. Like The, yeah. the, the, the fact that really there's no such thing as an adult because there's not, and the fact yeah. that there's really nobody truly in control because there's not, is honestly terrifying. But it's also true, and yeah. those I think there's a, a level of, you know, for for the habitual conspiracy people, I think that there is a level of uh, of uh, comfort they get from from thinking that someone is actually in control of something on the planet Earth. Yeah. And see, it's like things today have gotten so out of hand with people saying to children, like, it's because I'm an adult, you listen to me. And that's not what people used to say. People used to say, listen to your elders. And it was more based on these people have lived 10 decades more than you. They've gone through and become wiser. They've lived longer. They've seen more. That's all it's about. And what you you really start to realize is that's great when you're one-on-one with somebody. When you start putting people together, nothing ever runs like it's supposed to. (laughs) You um, mentioned your dad in your questionnaire. So how's your dad connected to all of this? All right. Um, So my dad has had these things too. He has had premonitions. And he comes from a generation that doesn't talk as much about things like that. And he's told me and the answer is more like, it's just weird. You know, that that's kind of his entire mindset is it's weird. But he doesn't look for answers in it. And I've only ever once had him show any sort of, or tell me about any sort of time where it affected a decision. Um, we were fishing out in Washington, D.C., and at the tidal basin, there's a stone wall that holds the water in 
inside the city to direct the river into mm -hmm. the basin. And, you know, at the time, he just says, get down from there. Don't walk along it. Right? And he tells me a few years later, like, because, you know, it really upset me. He snapped at me and was kind of crass and hateful about it. You know, don't do that. He gets scolded. You know, and at 14, it's kind of like, really, Dad? But later on, he tells me the reason he wanted me to get down is because he had a dream about me falling into the tidal basin and drowning. So. Oh, wow. And he doesn't, or at least with me, he hasn't really explained every instance or talked about it much. But he has told me that, like, yeah, I, I have this kind of thing happen all the time. Yeah, he has confided in me, but he doesn't talk about it. And it's not something that I am comfortable. Just, you know, I don't walk up, hi, my name's Marcus. I, I see into my own future. <laughs> you know. Great icebreaker. <laughs> yeah. It, it's unless the topic comes up in conversation, I don't talk about it. And, you know, maybe it's the upbringing I've had. But I'm not, you know, it's the, I, I'm not trying to seek attention from it or bring attention to it. Because the, the one thing that's the hardest for me is when people have 20 questions. You know, like, oh, you saw this person, what were they wearing? I don't remember what they were wearing. Yeah, that's not it's important not so at much. the time. Why would you know that? Yeah. Well, it's like the sadly most memorable instance I've had recently is um I had a friend pass away hmm. and this was about seven years ago now that he passed away six or seven and he was only 18 at the time but um I had a dream, Lord, a year or two before, where I was sitting in this room with a bunch of sad people, you know, people crying, just feeling sad. And I remember in the dream, the overwhelming feeling mm -hmm. of being sad and like it was my fault. And the one thing that stood out to me in the dream is a girl I hadn't talked to in years that I went to elementary school and high school with was was in the room sitting across from me at a table. But it's a room I've never been in. You know, it's not like it's happening in my dining room. It's somebody else's dining room. It's kind of dark and dreary. And we're just sitting at this little wood, dark wood table. And this person is sitting across from me talking about how sad everything is. And I remember at the time I had the dream, I'm just like, why would I be hanging out with this person? They weren't my favorite person that, from school or anything. They're not even somebody I would really associate with. And come to find out, they knew my friend who passed away. We In that point in time, we were all hanging out together. You know, doing things dumb young people do. And we all had a party the night before. Got drunk and whatever, but. Um, he had juvenile diabetes and I get a phone call the next day from my friend's mom and telling me he's dead. Oh my goodness. Uh, you know, I, I don't know who to call. I don't know who to talk to. Everyone's so tore up. And this was a friend of Michael's too. And it's just like at the time, I was like, you know, 
you're over 21, you should have been the responsible adult, all that stuff ran through my mind for the next few hours. You know? And I, I kind of hold this deep feeling of guilt because I didn't do what I was supposed to do, and it changed the way I do a lot of things now. Um, but yeah, we went through that entire horrible inc incident with the cops and paramedics and his family showing up and then we all went inside sat down at the table and started talking and it just it's like somebody dumped a bucket of cold water over me yeah like that instant feeling of oh god it's happened again mm-hmm and it's like, like I said, the dream was innocuous. It was just like sad and people I don't know. Yeah. But then it turned into a very real situation that I'm going, what just happened? Mm -hmm. I'm really sorry you went through that. That yeah, it sounds real. devastating. Um, have you been able to... This is the therapist in me. Sorry, I can't <laughs> not do it. But like, have you been able to kind of heal from that and release that blame that you initially put on yourself? Yeah. And it's sad to say I didn't seek help with it. Um, Michael majors in psychology in college and he's getting ready to finish his degree. And I've talked about it with him a few times. And you know, he gives me the therapist, well, you can't blame yourself. It's not all your fault. But the thing I found easiest for me to actually cope with it was to put some of the blame on my friend because he was a person too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's not like he was a child. Right. He was 18 years old. He knew he had juvenile diabetes. He knew what he should and shouldn't do. He was a young man who made a fatal mistake. Yeah, for sure. Regardless of any part I played in it, it's a very well same thing could have very well happened if I'd have not been there at all. Right. He made his own choices. Absolutely. Yeah. How did you all? And I've since coped with it. I was irresponsible, and I learned from it. But I don't blame myself to the extent I did. Good. Good. Have you ever had an experience kind of similar to the one your dad had with you where you felt like you had to warn somebody about something that you dreamed about? Well, I've had a few experiences. And they've been... The, the feeling of dodged a bullet has come true a couple times. And then one time I'm going, you saw that coming <laughs> and you could have avoided that. Um, one night I'm picking, or one morning, I say night because it was 4 a.m., but one morning I'm picking Michael up to take him to work. And I drive by this drugged out person as I drive by, screams, hollers, and then it hits me. You dreamt that he's going to throw a brick at your car. Whoa! But I get to I go inside, talk to Michael, get some coffee, and we take off. And I'm like, maybe I shouldn't go that way. Maybe I shouldn't drive back, back past him because he'll be there, you know it. And I'm like, no, nah, no, nah, it's just a dream. You're putting too much into it. You know, young and not as wise to what's going on. And drove right back by, and that was another time it had happened. Is I ended up with a nice big brick in, back, in the side of my car. And the overwhelming desire to run somebody over with my car. <laughs> um understandable yeah but and then like 
ever since that moment, anytime I've had the feeling of we've done this before, I and it's ended badly, I, I second guess actually going through into the same situation. Mm -hmm. Um for instance, one night while I was at the game store, um I had parked up in the gravel parking lot, which is across the street, up and down an alley to get to from the game store. And I had had a dream that I got robbed in that alley. So instead of walking up there by myself, like I usually do, I stood there and talked to my friend that runs the game store until he was ready to leave and walked with him. But, and of course, Jonathan, you know, Mike, and all yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I stood there and waited because I'm like, no, not today, not alone. Yeah. Because it's like in the dream, I was alone. So I felt like if I wasn't alone, then it wouldn't happen. Mm -hmm. That could change the situation somehow. Yeah. 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 Like, yeah we won't be using that parking lot at night anymore. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, to be fair in the dream the little light that pops on didn't pop on when I walked down the alley so you know there's that but I don't know I don't trust anything <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what kind of fuels some of my skepticism is I have this internal distrust of things to start with mm -hmm. um and I'm sure that stems from, you know, all the lovely side effects of whatever kind of minor mental disorders we all have. <laughs> yeah. But I'm with you on that one, buddy. I I think that it's healthy to to ask questions about basically everything. Like it's just, you know, just because you're asking a question of something doesn't mean that, that you you know don't believe people. It doesn't mean you don't believe yourself. It just means you just want more information. Wanting more information, I think, is never a bad thing. That's why I'm trying to take the, the word skeptic back from the debunkers. Are there any talking about all this stuff, going through all these things that, that you've that, that you've you know that you've dreamed and seen in, in the the fact that it also at least occasionally affects your father. Are there are there questions that you specifically have that like that you ask about this like you know, to yourself or to the universe or something? Yeah. Um the most prominent one would have to be why the green goat. Yeah. I'd be asking that too. That's a I cool mean, visual image though. It's a very weird image. <laughs> um, and it's not like, and, and what re is really weird is it's not always I see the goat in premonitory dreams. It's sometimes I'll just be having a really nice dream and then there will be the goat. It, it kind of reminds me of like, I don't know if you've seen Adventure Time, but the cosmic owl who appears in your dreams and makes your dreams a reality type deal. That's interesting. I am definitely looking that up right now. Oh, that's a <laughs> weird image. That is wild. <laughs> Everybody should look up the cosmic owl from Adventure Time. That's a future tattoo right there. <laughs> that's crazy. Have you always seen the green goat in these dreams, or did it start at a certain point? Um, you know, to be honest, I can't really answer that question because in my mind, I can't picture the goat. Hmm. Like sitting here right now, trying to see the goat in my mind, I can't see the goat. And there are sometimes like I know I've seen him, and there are other times like he may have been there and I didn't see him. It's just it would give me a really weird feeling to be around a goat dyed green. 
<laughs> but I keep expecting that. Like I go to a petting zoo or something at the state fair or something, and there's like a green goat. Yeah. But, but yeah, I don't. I don't know if he shows up for everyone or not. And sadly, as time goes on, memories fade. Especially dreams and things. Mm -hmm. Super interesting, though. Yeah, absolutely. But... Your own personal cryptid. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hashtag find the green goat. Yeah. <laughs> That's a restaurant here, isn't it? Green yeah. Goat. yeah, Green yeah. Goat. Yeah, and that, in West Hina. That really freaked me out when they opened. I, I bet. Yeah, I believe it, man. Have you eaten there? You should go eat there. You win a lottery I've been that so day. Scared to go. No, that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna buy a lottery ticket, then go. Yeah. <laughs> or maybe I should go first. Yeah, go first, then get the lottery ticket. <laughs> well, man, else? we really appreciate you talking to us. This has been I appreciate y'all having me. It's been kind of nice to express it. Good. Yeah. That's I mean, that's really what we want to do here is you know, give people a platform where they can talk about this stuff, you know, and we can normalize it a little bit more because you are the first person we've talked to who has had premonitory dreams, but you're definitely not the only person out there who has this yeah. experience. So thank you for sharing your stories with us. I think it's really important. Yeah, I really appreciate it. And I just, to me, it's important for people to know, like, even if you doubt, like I do, that it's all connected to something, mm -hmm. it's important to share it. Yeah. To just get it out, out there, because keeping stuff like that to yourself all the time just creates a toxic situation on the inside. Definitely. I agree with you there, for sure. All right. Well, we really appreciate you being with us tonight and sharing all your stories and it's good chat. Thank you so much for being here. If you have a strange story you want to share with us, email us at seekerandskeptic at gmail.com. We look forward to talking to you soon.